Hi, welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad to see some uh, old acquaintances here. So uh, welcome to you all, uh, Marty and Kirk. And uh, we've got questions. I'm not sure how I can deal with them uh, today in, in the webinar, but we will try. Uh, if we don't actually answer them during the um, during the webinar, we'll, we'll message you right back uh, after we finish. So do interact, do ask the questions, which I'm getting prompted up. Um, but my production team, I thought I'd keep them at a distance today uh, after what happened with um, Alex Baldwin on the set. They, nobody wants to work and be anywhere near me today. So um, the second issue I've got is that, um, you know, um, as you can see, I, I can use reading glasses, um, but if I don't use them, I don't see the screen. So there's a bit of everything there. So I've got my notes here and we're going to crack away and look at through. We've seen quite a bit of stuff come through this month about um, tax. And uh, for me, it's all very orchestrated with uh, the Pandora's Papers being released, um, you know, just before the OECD announced their, their change of uh, arrangements with their global tax plans. Um, the Pandora's Papers uh, are released through uh, an international media organization based in Washington. Um, it, it's got a name. I'm, I don't know what connection it got with the NSA or, the, or any other, uh, or the IRS, but, you know, it, 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 it is it's one of those things that looks like it's a modern day state-sponsored hacking uh, job. Um, and designed to highlight quite a few things. Now, some of the stuff that got into the press and into the media uh, was correct, but some of it was, was hyped up and, and it was possibly inappropriate the way they presented it. Um, some, of the, some of those actions taking place under the Pandora Papers were legitimate actions and things that you would do to protect your family and business capital uh, so that your benefits pass to you and your family and not to the taxman. That's why we save in, in ISAs and pensions uh, and that's why we leave stuff in trust for our children or, or give to charity. So um, the, the, the movements are not necessarily illegal and the arrangements are not going to be made illegal. Uh, how you organise your wealth, your family's money and business is your choice to make. Um, the key is, is to um, uh, obey the rules. Um, in, I'm not a big religious person, um, but in, in a lot of the religions that use the, um, the Bible or the Quran, which is the same, a different version of the same document, um, and the Jewish Bible is the Old Testament. They all talk in, in old terms about saving 10% of your income as a prudent way of going forward. And in some religions, evangelicals and Muslims, that's counted, that's taken in uh, as, as a collection for the church and, uh, and, and the religion. And, uh, you know, they then become charitable foundations, as some of those have been used for ill-gotten gains, whether you talk about the Crusades 100 years ago, uh, or, or whether you talk about um, bombing airlines out of the sky. So money laundering on an international scale is big business uh, for drugs, for uh, terrorism, and, and those are the people that they're trying to monitor, but everybody else gets swept up in that. If you're obeying the rules, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. Um, so that, that, that's my take on, on the Pandora Papers. If you're trying to uh, hide and, and lie and cheat, then you know, there are laws in, in any society that, that limit uh, what we can do and how we do it. So Pandora Papers, um, some morally incorrect things, but um, some breaches of personal uh, information and personal data, which is, is embarrassing. Um, but um, 
from a number of different perspectives, but there are still tools that, that people can use in there. Now, with the OECD, the, the, what we're getting from that is a global minimum tax rate, and that comes in in 2023. So, first of all, it's not going to apply this year, um, but the arrangements are being put in place. Now, that, that global minimum tax rate of 15% means that if you're Google or Facebook um, or Microsoft or Apple, then you should pay 15% of your uh, global um, at minimum rate of 15% corporation tax on your global profits. Now, you would have thought that was quite sensible, but there are ways and means uh, that when you trade with your business around the world, different countries have different tax rates. And, and therefore, if uh, your company's holding company is, is not in the USA or it's not in Australia or it's not in the UK, um, the corporation tax is applied in another jurisdiction, which if it's Cyprus or Ireland is 12.5%. Um, and, and, th and therefore, that means you can be paid lower taxes. But there are also jurisdictions that pay 0% tax. And if you've got um, parts of your business that can take profit from one company to the next, you can end up paying less and less and less tax. Um, uh, the problem that a lot of countries have with Google, whether it be France or Germany or UK, uh, or Australia is that they make lots of profit and none of that corporation tax profit made in that country is taxed as corporation tax in the countries that they operate in around the world. So allowed to operate everywhere, but they don't pay the local tax. So China doesn't get to tax those companies at 25%, which is their corporation tax rate on the revenues that they generate uh, with a third of the world's population living in, in the Chinese state. So those, those are some of the issues that, that, that are being brought about. So there's two parts of the global tax uh, agreement. One is a minimum tax rate. So if, if Facebook make 9 billion profit, 9 billion profit, I haven't chosen a good figure there. Um, if Facebook make 10 billion profit, then they will pay at least one and a half billion in, in corporation tax around the world and by default to their own country, which would be the USA. The second pillar, though, is that uh, with these very large companies, um, first of all, the, the global tax rate only applies to uh, turnover in excess of, of 750 billion euros, 750 billion euros. Not talking about small businesses here, not talking about medium-sized businesses, we're talking about global players here. So this is a direct attack on, on the massive oil, financial services, and, and tech companies that operate around the world with massive turnovers. <clears throat> and these are the people who are going to be impacted. But the second pillar is that in each country, that they operate. If, if, if a, these big companies have got 20 billion in sales annually, then uh, the, the income revenue that's being generated can be divided in the countries in which it operates. Now, there's technical formulas for this. The, this is not the target of, of this webinar directly, so I'm not going to go into detail of that. But <clears throat> essentially, um, if, if, if Google uh, have got a, a European base in, in Ireland and, um, uh, uh, and under the global taxation rules, a minimum 15%, that 15% tax would be paid in Ireland. However, the second pillar of this global tax treaty means that of, because of the sales are more than 20 billion a year, European countries... EU countries uh, will be able to uh, tax a proportion, say 25% of the revenue that, that is generated in, 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 in another country. <clears throat> so uh, the UK will be able to take some of Google's uh, profits and, and charge them to uh, sales in the, in the UK. 
in charge of the corporation tax in the UK. So um, that might mean that uh, Google are paying higher taxes uh, or Exxon are paying higher taxes in Germany or Norway than they would have been in, in, in Ireland. The average tax rate has to be 15% corporation tax rate. So it actually may not mean uh, a massive thing. So Ireland have rushed to increase their, their minimum tax level from 12.5% to 15%, which is okay. I'm certain they've got agreements for the tech companies that are based in Ireland, which include Apple, Google, Facebook, um, TikTok, I think, are there. Um, and uh, there's a few others that are based in Ireland. All, the, all those companies will have been in, agreed to pay that minimum 15% to that Ireland subsidiary beforehand. But they won't pay any more and they won't pay any less than that. 15% will go towards any final tax in the ultimate country uh, of ownership, which could be China or it could be USA. So every country around the world will benefit from that. So it, it, there will be a lot of application and um, the profiteering from that. But <clears throat> what, what, what's happened in the past, though, would be that uh, the sales aren't necessarily equated into the net profit because money gets moved between countries. So we're going to have a look at that later. So let's just consider first what the corporation tax rates are around the world. So the e EU average corporation tax rate is 20, nearly 21%, whereas globally, it, it's nearly 23%. So the, the, the global average of corporation tax is about 23%. Um, the EU average is, is nearly 21%. Conversely, the European average is around 90%. So the European average is much lower because countries like uh, Estonia, Romania, uh, Montenegro, uh, UK, Malta, Cyprus, uh, Andorra have offered lower tax rates to tax residents than, than the rest of Europe. Okay, so um, the, 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 the Europe it has got a lower tax rate, but it's still above the 15%. But those countries around the world like um, Andorra, uh, Bahrain, uh, Jersey, which may have a zero tax rate. And by uh, having a subsidiary or a holding company operating in that other jurisdiction, uh, that means that uh, the uh, company can take expense out of the high tax country and put it into the low tax country. And that's why uh, companies like Google or Facebook can end up paying very, very little tax relative to their, their profits. And maybe paying a corporation tax of, I don't know the figures, you know, two, three percent on the total tax bill rather than the global rate of 15% that they're, they're looking to do now. <clears throat> so a, a company could currently be paying 17% corporation tax. On, on net profits or turnover, that's going to rise to a minimum of 15. Uh, if you paid more than that in your country of operation, um, and, and but you are a, a cross-border uh, company, you're not going to pay any more. So there'll be a double taxation compensation for that. Um, so com companies will still <coughs> potentially be liable to pay up to the OECD average, which is 23%. So some countries do charge high rates. China's 25. <clears throat> um, Malta's 35 highest corporation tax rate. China's 20% and 25% in Germany, 30%. The UK had recently announced <clears throat> that they're increasing corporation tax from 19 to 26%. But again, that is only for bigger companies. So that it's a positioning strategy, A, to get more revenue from local companies, but under this Global Taxation Treaty, um, they'll have a bit higher tax rate from the portion of income 
that they can tax for these global tax companies. Uh, so it's just a way, it's a clever way of the UK keeping more tax from the big global company companies that want to operate around the world in their Germany and in the UK, but pay a bit more tax there. And they'll take the tax off their, their parent location where their, their holding company is. Um, so again, it, it's all about transferring uh, profit and taxes between jurisdictions, which will continue to be legal, just the amount of tax the very big companies are going to pay will, will be a lot higher. I'm sure you've got lots of questions on that, but I can't see them, not without my glasses on, so patience with me, please. <coughs> so the... Um, so let's have a look who gets taxed. Not, not, not what the rate is, because this is, this is our expertise, this is our business, this is what we uh, look to guide expat family and business living and working abroad whether you're an employee or you're running your own business or you want to move it and, and share your profits. Uh, what, 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 what are the steps that you need to take? And it's about the tax residence. <clears throat> so as individual expats, an individual has a tax residence. Um, now, if you're operating through your own personal service company, the personal service company has its own tax number and its own tax identity. So therefore, the, the contractor, the personal service company operative uh, in the UK could have a flat rate, 19% corporation tax rate, uh, as opposed to a personal income tax rate of up to 45%. So that works really, really well uh, within one, one jurisdiction. But when you think about working cross-border, uh, things have become a lot more interesting. So there are countries with uh, little or no tax payable <clears throat> or a maximum tax rate of 12.5% below the, the global averages. And in these countries, you could be your, your individual tax resident, but the corporation tax could be paid in another jurisdiction. <clears throat> so you're transferring the money cross-border. And in this post-COVID world, where more people are choosing using technology to work remotely, whether you're in Google or whether you're uh, working from home in, in uh, Berkshire instead of in the, the city of London, uh, remote work is now by IT. But what about if you're working across border? How could that work and how can that benefit you? So by separating the individual and the company, so if you're trading your your uh, economic activity through a personal service company, you can control uh, where you pay your corporation tax and where you pay your income tax. Um, and that depends in part as well on where the activity is, where the economic activities, as well as uh, of doing the work and also where the contracts are and where the residence is. Uh, but there's more ways. We saw in Panama papers uh, with a trust and um, um, properties are owned in trust. Now, trusts, have, I've got a, a bad press because a lot of them are taxed very heavily. Um, but that's not the purpose of a, a, a trust uh, to be an active uh, source of holdings. It is designed, a trust is primarily designed to protect your assets. So, going back to the Crusaders, this is when the concept of trust was created under English law that the, the night that while we are going to fight in the wars across the world um, would entrust his castle and his keep and his family uh, to uh, another person to, to take care of and look after those assets. So give them the authority to collect the income, pay the taxes, pay, collect the taxes maybe, and, uh, and, and generally look after the affairs. Um, <clears throat> so that's what a trust can do. So if you want to um, make sure, if you're cross-border and you've got property in more than one jurisdiction, whether that's shares of your company, whether it's investments of your, uh, of your savings, or whether it's property that you own in different jurisdictions, then by owning it within a trust, you remove the uncertainty, the expense and the cost 
of, of managing those assets if anything goes wrong um, and in managing them anyway, um, which is what you need to do. So in the days now where we have to verify our income because of the issues raised uh, and highlighted by the Pandora Papers with um, uh, financial uh, 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 criminal activity uh, around the world, it, uh, often you can't maintain a local bank or finance or investment, uh, or you have to turn up in person, or you have to explain for expensive uh, attorneys to represent you and have documents up still and certified and instructions uh, and complications. But well, that's what the trust does. So if you look at the, the ultimate uh, personal service companies around the world, it is the professional footballers. So you see international footballers moving around the world. Um, and, and generally, by and large, they, they would operate through the trust uh, operation. Um, and if, in effect, there's a few like Ronaldo and uh, Jose Mourinho got in tr- and, and Messi got in trouble a few years ago in Spain um, because they, they got called to account. It's the same in the UK as well and Hungary. Um, they were trying to operate through employee benefit trusts, which, which is great. So my, my five million a year income is paid into a trust and I can avoid income and corporation taxes on that. The reason it didn't work um, was that they were then drawing all that income out to spend and not paying income tax. If they hold the money in the trust and they buy property, they buy boats, they buy cars, they buy businesses and investments, then that's fine. They, they just taxed on the income that comes out. An employee benefit trust is a type of pension. So we all, uh, most of us have a form of pension and the pension is a trust. We entrust our savings to a financial institution to invest it well or invest it badly, uh, invest it for our benefit or invest it for their benefit. Um, you know, and so that when we draw the money out, we produce tax for income. So uh, a pension trust fund is, is a highly regulated uh, taxable fund, which the authorities are happy with because the tax position is clear. And as long as the tax position is always clear, then uh, you, you, you're okay with that. In Central America and the Caribbean, um, trusts, and, and trust companies and companies were, were the trust companies were registered, but the trust didn't weren't, weren't um, and the companies didn't have a tax registration, and that was the issue. There was no tax liability, but there was no tax registration. Therefore, there was no record of the activity. If you're a UK expat and you're working abroad, uh, be that in Australia, in China, in in Kenya, um, or wherever you're working. You could be working in the Middle East uh, in a jurisdiction with no tax. If you're not a tax resident in another jurisdiction, a British citizen is still taxed on their worldwide income in the UK. So you have to have a, 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 a tax resident somewhere in the world. Otherwise, the tax on your worldwide income falls to uh, your home country. So under that principle, a trust can um, hold investments and receive dividends um, or, or rent, rental income and potentially avoid some capital gains or, or income taxes. Um, the charities are an adapted form of trust, but it's still basically a, a trust company. So with a charity, uh, again, if you choose to operate your business <coughs> or uh, take up your fortune into a charitable organisation or foundation, the type of trust where you can get tax breaks as well. So UK uh, tax residents can give up to all their income and, and companies a portion of their income to the charity uh, and avoid corporation tax completely. Uh, so that, that's another way forward that, that uh, is a way of managing money. So it it means you can protect the assets down the generations. So the Duke of Wellington got very rich after the Battle of Waterloo, 
made a lot of money, proud nation, very happy with him. And, and the Duke of Westminster, his direct descendant, is now deemed to be one of the richest people in the UK. And he owns Knightsbridge and Kensington and large parts of the, the most expensive real estate in England, uh, in, in London. Um, but he's not the richest man. It's all owned by a trust. Uh, the, the Duke of Westminster is a trustee. He manages his trust. That will give him a job and an income where it pays you in tax. His family might receive income from that. But within the trust, the trust will have its own tax regime. Um, so if you create a, a trust and the trust has no additional tax liability on it, you're protecting the capital within it. But the company within the trust will still pay tax at whatever relevant local rate is. So if a, if a company is trading globally and it's, and it's deemed to be on a, a, a minimum tax, a, a, a corporation tax rate of 15%, it will still pay that 15% tax. If its corporation tax is 12.5% for Cyprus or 19 in the UK, that's the rate that, that, that it will pay. So there's lots of opportunities there um, to, to still use a trust um, and, and not evade tax, but protect your capital and protect your asset and have that holding company. Um, so trusts, pensions, companies, individuals, uh, charities, they're all different types. And there's also investment funds and life insurance funds as well. They're all different taxable entities. And there's a way to place funds a capital and an income to protect it from a higher rate of personal tax. Um, it can protect you to a degree for capital gains tax. So um, uh, the capital gains tax still arises where the capital gains tax is. So for UK expats, the, the, there's a bonus that the UK expat can leave the UK, not pay corporation tax, uh, not pay capital gains tax on any disposal as long as they stay outside the UK for five years, but they have to move out from the UK first before they make that selling decision, uh, which is why you find people going to Singapore or Monaco before they do a big business sale or, or disposal. Um, but the expense thing is very important as well. So if you've got royalties, licenses, uh, patents, trademarks, if these are owned by uh, uh, a holding company or a a rights company um, or rights individual that's in a low tax environment, they can expense the company which has got the higher corporation tax rates. Um, and, and therefore, that's another way of moving money around. And this is where the Facebooks, Apples, and uh, Googles in this world have been making money uh, or, or not paying tax, should I say. And, and so the, the, there's big opportunities to consider what your brand is, what your uh, 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 licenses are that you're granting uh, to your uh, overseas uh, businesses that uh, they're operating. And it's a way of taking profits out of a high uh, corporation tax jurisdiction to a low tax, ju tax jurisdiction. So there's lots that we can do on that. Uh, and the key for us at ProAct is all, always who benefits. Um, the, the people that benefit should be the family uh, and not the tax man and not, and not the professionals. I'm not saying that we, we don't, we do work for free, you know, there's an expense, but by planning ahead, looking forward, organising the assets in such a way, you can avoid the expense and delay of probate, uh, you can avoid the expense and delay of additional taxes, uh, and you can remain clean and compliant around the world in, in, in what you're doing. Cyprus um, have responded to the OECD's global tax rules. So have Ireland. Ireland have increased their minimum corporation tax rate from 12.5% to 15% starting next year, so a year ahead of the OECD rules. Cyprus have started a different initiative, which comes out in, in 2022, there's already some very, very interesting opportunities for expats. But Cyprus is also the 54th uh, most 
easiest place to open a company in the world. So, um, and trusts are just as hard, if not harder. So it, it is a, a difficult place. It's going to rapidly transition from a paper-based system uh, to an online system, um, accelerated by COVID. And uh, it, it, there's some very, very good expertise, fantastic broadband speeds, and a low tax, stable tax regime. Um, and increasingly, it's got a financial services and a technology sector, which, you, which is uh, growing and expanding. And they've announced an initiative to develop that and, and build it further. Um, and they want to build a business and trade center uh, in, in Cyprus, along the lines that you see in, in UAE and Dubai. And, and uh, maybe this is a missed opportunity from the past, but it's a way that they're going forward, focusing on things like technical innovation and high tech and finance and, uh, and biotechnologies um, with a stable European-based economy with a low corporation tax of 12.5%. For non-EU uh, expats, they're also going to change for that from 2022. So for UK, an EU expat can technically move uh, and, and set up a business in Cyprus at, at any time. But anybody else from around the world has got, got more, more of a challenge. As an individual, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't create a, a Cyprus trust. So Cyprus has an international trust. And this could become part of a holding operation for your investments or your property or your uh, companies around the world. Now, if you, if you qualify to set up a Cyprus international trust, you will pay uh, as an expat 0% uh, dividends, 0% corporation tax, 0% interest tax and 0% income tax on any global income at all. Um, now, that doesn't mean you won't be subjected to the uh, OECD's global tax, minimum tax rules. That only applies to companies that are turning over more than 750 million euros, um, uh, 650 million pounds. So if you're below that level, the Cyprus International Trust can work as a holding company and give you a, a base, a corporation tax of 12 and a half percent still, and be legitimate and be within the EU framework. Um, for third countries though, that, that there are tightened EU rules that apply throughout the EU and Cyprus uh, have got some discretion on how to apply those. And these are the new rules that are coming in. And there are after two types of, uh, of non-EU citizens, and this will include British people, so, um, uh, first of all, the, the, there's going to be an accelerated uh, business visa um, with uh, setting up a, a company to operate in Cyprus where your minimum income is 2500 um, per month with, and your degree level qualification. Uh, a third country national can come to Cyprus and set up a business uh, operating here and get residency and get citizenship after five years. Now, at the moment, the application process starts after seven years and it's very slow, so you won't get it before 10 years. But the same now that naturalization, citizenship, uh, first site of business visa, the individual to be resident here and, and the business um, is accelerated and citizenship within five years. For the niche, and, and they're also amending the legislation specifically to attract digital nomads. So if you um, want to live in Cyprus uh, as a tax resident, um, but your work is abroad, um, your contract is abroad, they will allow you to come here and, and um, uh, uh, be a Cyprus tax resident without uh, uh, excessive Cyprus taxes. Uh, it sometimes also works uh, as a tax base for people that are, are working in other jurisdictions. So if you're an expat individual and you need to go and work in um, China or Dubai or Saudi Arabia, you only have to be in 
Cyprus for 60 days a year to be deemed to be a tax resident for that year. So as long as you don't become a tax resident in another jurisdiction, you can remain a tax resident in, in Cyprus for just 60 days a year. Now, if you're working in Saudi, um, you know, and you're working for 10 months a year and two months a year in Cyprus, aren't you going to be a tax inside? The tax in Saudi is 0%. So potentially what you've got is a liability to the tax in your own country because your tax resident is, you, you've not got any formal tax residency. Uh, Cyprus can give that and, and, and they won't tax you on your overseas income necessarily if that's still taxed in Saudi. So you've got, you've got that option as well. So it makes it very tax efficient. Taxes for individuals, expats, um, for 17 years is 0% on dividends and 0% on interest. So if you've got um, a personal service company and you're, you're living and working as a, a nomad or, or uh, a, on a business visa, the dividends you'll receive uh, as, as part of your income, so a digital nomad working on a contract could pay 100,000 of um, income on dividends and, and pay 0% tax, 0% on interest on investments. So if you're charging somebody um, for, for using services uh, or making loans to other parts of your business and charging interest on that from overseas, those two taxes are, are 0%. Um, but it gets even better because the new uh, tax exemptions for the business visas um, or the digital nomads or the high skilled employees that the, these new businesses form is, is, is quite, it, it's also on income tax. So um, it's quite generous already, but it's extended even more. So up to 100,000 a year, you can get 50% off the, the Cyprus tax rates for up to 17 years. So the maximum Cyprus uh, tax rate only goes up to 35%. Um, but that could be reduced for an expat by 50%. So the maximum income tax rate you pay is, is, is around 18% for 17 years, the first 17 years of your working in country. And that's for income, not to about dividends or income tax, just to uh, for, for income tax liability there. Um, if you're uh, income is below 55,000 a year, below 4,500 a month, then the, the tax break is 20%. So somebody on 4,000 a year will have their tax rate reduced by uh, 20%. And that 20% is for 17 years, not 10 years as it was in the past, 17 years. So a new expat coming to Cyprus. Um, could um, live and work here, pay no tax on dividends or interest, um, and have 50% um, pay half the amount of tax. So pay a maximum rate of 79%, standard rate to pay 10% tax for 17 years, which is going to compete with any other legit legitimate jurisdiction in Europe uh, or around the world. Um, if an expat creates a Cyprus International Trust and owns property and capital through that uh, around the world and, and, and banking trust and savings, there'll be no additional tax in Cyprus on those assets. Uh, Cyprus law is, follows English law, um, but the family can stay in control of, of the trust and pay no tax. So it's not like uh, creating a... a, a a, a trust in the UK or Australia where you'd automatically have um, a, a tax liability, uh, possibly even just on holding capital. Um, the, the Cyprus Trust can hold capital without receiving any tax, but it can also make, take income from around the world without paying any additional tax. It doesn't mean that the the UK company is not going to generate corporation tax on its trading activities in the UK, um, but the the Cyprus Trust could receive a, 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 
uh, an income from a loan that it makes to that business, for example, or from a, a, you know, another type of um, uh, income that it gets from a, a royalty or uh, a, a, a brand or a patent or a license in, in, some, in some respects. So there's lots of things to do. There is a, individuals have a, and companies do have a, a intellectual property tax, which you know again comes down to about ten percent of Cyprus. So it's very very competitive. So that's Cyprus's response to um, the, the global tax rules to say that um, they're extending the concessions to expats for seventeen years. Uh, they can come and live and work in, in, in Cyprus or be Cyprus-based, um, or the businesses can be Cyprus-based, and they can reduce, have a reduced level of taxation, 50% off, up to 50% off, at least 20%. Um, but, but a digital nomad has got the opportunity to do the contract on the work abroad through a personal service company, receive dividends at 0% income tax, so all these things are, are, are make Cyprus a very competitive place, either to be the holding company for for business and investment and pension, and property assets, or um, to be your base for living and working uh, around the world. Um, and at this point, especially the question is, as you can see, I've got my I've got my glasses on, so I might be able to see some questions if they pop up. No. My assistant would pop those questions up if you were there and I would see them. So, <clears throat> with ProAct, we operate in two ways. We've got um, uh, uh, an online business and we've got a secure online uh, app that we're developing. Uh, to provide real-time updates and information to, to expats all around the world. Uh, our focus is UK-based, uh, UK expats living working around the world, but that could be living in the UK. Um, that could be living in the UK, or it could be people that are just from the UK living around the world. Um, the very famous... Uh, Old, old chap who lived in Monaco for many years, but unfortunately, as Will said, I want to um, be buried in a family crypt in, in England. And because after his death in Monaco, he, he was returned to the grave, the UK got it through inheritance tax. Um, so UK expats got this liability to 40% inheritance tax. And that's why saving in, in, a, in a tax efficient way to use the money as you want, whether it's for charitable um, uh, or, or just to build your investment portfolio in something that you control rather than a third party investment a company. It's an employee brokers, your financial advisors, but, but you're in control of that. And then it can pass down the generations without cross border issues uh, because you understand the, the questions. Uh, Product also offer, uh, Tom, a, a free review. Um, to expats uh, living around the world, whether you're an existing client or a new client. So we will always do a free review on the general circumstance. You can register with our chat with us live at productpartnership.co.uk and we'll pick up that with you there. You can book a call. We've got people that can speak to you uh, and, and, and guide you through the general information. Um, with our retained client service, um, from 30 a month to 300 a year, we're trying to build up a, a, a valuable back uh, office of uh, guidance and advice and information for you to follow. So there's guides there. I'm going to build up the, the series of, of, of videos on how to do um, particular scenarios. Obviously, if you've got a particular situation, um, um, Retained clients can speak to a consultant during the year to get that update. But um, uh, uh, if you need a detailed report, we do that. And the way we, you know, we give you the free review uh, online. But uh, if you want to do writing, then obviously 
we do start to make charges there. Um, but if we do a, a, a report for you, a tax haven report, then that would be offset against the cost of any future work that we did, you know, be that tax returns or registrations or, or company formations. The third thing in front of me here, by the way, that's, um, that's to stop me echoing. Um, so I hope you're not too disturbed by that. Um, any other questions? I'm going to um, leave you there then. Hope you like this. We're going to replay up soon. If you've got any inquiries, go to productpartnership.com and, and leave an online inquiry there in the old fashioned way. Or, or uh, if you've got a, a you've registered on our chat with us, it's a secure server, go straight through to the client service team. They're available um, eight or six Monday to Friday work days, not, not public holidays or weekends. Um, uh, to answer your question, but we'll get back to you anyway and we'll give you updates from there and get an email for that as well. But it's secure, you have to set your password up. We've got no way of helping you with that. So, if you've got any feedback on that, let us know because we're trying to improve the system to make it a secure uh, community for expats living and working abroad. So, that's uh, the chat with us live and retain client services at productpartnership.co.uk or contact us at productpartnership.co.uk come contact us and we'll organize a free review with one of our product advisors. Uh, thank you, Chris, again. And um, I'm glad we've had a better talk. Last time that I spoke with a client, I was stuck driving across the UK. Uh, it was a wonderful journey, but my detour was because of the, um, the climate change activists who glued themselves to the M25 in the UK. So that was a memorable day. Uh, <coughs> uh, thanks very much, and we'll see you again next time. Uh, look out for last Wednesday in November, uh, for next Wednesday webinar.